Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light and our salvation. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word you claim us as your beloved children making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life, and above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Glorious God, your generosity waters the world with goodness, and you cover creation with abundance. Awaken in us a hunger for the food that satisfies both body and spirit, and with this food fill all the starving world through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let the children come. Good morning, children. I'm so glad to be with you today. We're going to hear a story from the Bible in a minute that Pastor Bradley will read for us, and it's a story I bet you and your parents have talked about before. It's a story of when Jesus feeds 5,000 people with just a few fish and a few loaves of bread. It's a wonderful story of how much God cares for us, how much Jesus wants us all to have everything we need. But there's a funny line in the story that always makes me wonder. It says that there were 
5,000 people there besides the women and children. Not counting the women and children when they counted up the people. Does that seem strange to you? That seems strange to me. I think the women and the children counted. They mattered. They were hungry too. They had to eat too. There are times when people don't count everybody. There were times in our country's history where people counted as if they were fractions of people. That doesn't even make sense. I think that story is included in scripture because Jesus thinks women and children matter. I think Jesus counts all of the people, counts the children, and knows just how many uh, there are of all of the people that are hungry. This morning, Jesus can count all the people that are in your household. And Jesus can count all of the people who are watching this video. And Jesus can count all of the people who are hungry in the whole world. And Jesus thinks each one of us matters. All of the women, all of the children, all of everyone. Jesus thinks you matter. And I think that's why when they wrote the Bible, they remembered to add that phrase that there were really more than 5,000 people that Jesus cared about. All of them were hungry and Jesus made sure all of them were fed. Will you pray with me? Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, you count us. You count each person. You count each child. Thank you for counting us. You know that we matter. We know that everyone matters. Help us feed everyone. Amen. Thank you, children. A reading from Isaiah. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you. Because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Listen, listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort and joy. Listen, listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort and joy. Jesus gave his mandate. That he came to save us. Listen, listen, God is calling. Through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort and joy. Listen, listen, God is calling. Through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort and joy. Let none be forgotten Throughout the world In the triune name of God Go and baptize 
listen, listen, God is calling, through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort and joy. Listen, listen, God is calling, through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort and joy. Help us to be faithful. Walking in your precepts. Listen, listen, God is calling. Through the word inviting. Offering forgiveness, comfort and joy. Listen, listen, God is calling. Through the word inviting. Offering forgiveness, comfort and joy. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace be to you in the name of Jesus, who is our bread of life. On Wednesday morning this week, I joined the 30 days of prayer. In the words of the organizers, healing in the heart of our city, which is what it was called, is a month long collaborative project to respond to and to transform the pain we are experiencing in Minneapolis. It is an attempt to add a vital spiritual dimension to the strategic thinking, policy proposals, and investments being considered. There were about nine or 10 chairs set up so that a small group could gather and keep silence for eight minutes and 46 seconds, which is the amount of time Derek Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's neck, killing him. There was a brief introduction to the prayer time. We were invited to imagine the future, and then the leader rang a gong and the silence began. As I sat there on West Broadway in North Minneapolis, a couple blocks down from that Cub Foods that was looted, I could see across the street a space where a building had once stood, now burned to the ground. I watched cars passing by. I watched people on the street and that moment from the end of May, the video of George Floyd kept coming back to my heart. 
And while I sat there in my chair, breathing quietly, taking it all in, I began to think, why am I here? What difference does it really make that I'm sitting in this chair and saying a prayer? Am I there for show so I can post about it on Facebook and feel good about myself? Am I really willing to do the work that is required right now? Can I? Or can we, as Gloria Day, separated as we are, step forward and do this work? It's kind of amazing how quickly when you're sitting in silence, all of your stuff comes up. Your fears, your wounds, your insecurities, your doubts, they just surge forward, which is probably why we don't use a lot of silence. Because it can be a dangerous thing, that space of quiet between you and your stuff, or you and injustice, you and the world's hunger, you and COVID-19. In those minutes of silence, I felt totally inadequate, a fraud really, a pastor who can talk big, but is also afraid of losing something that I can't even always name or admit out loud. Now I'm telling you this not so that you will rush to my defense and say, oh no, you're not a fraud, even though I enjoy being the center of a story. That is really not my point. I'm telling you this because I have heard this deep sense of inadequacy spoken again and again as you have told your own stories. How can I be a good parent and a good employee? and face a fall with more online learning, all of us in this house together 24-7. How can I make it through this distance? My beloved on quarantine in a care center. How can I possibly make it through this diagnosis, this illness, this impending death? How can I make it another day with the emotional resources that I have, which on some days seem so strong, but then on the next day seem totally inadequate? Much less, how do I use everything that I have been given to change the world, to tackle the deep hunger around the globe? racial injustice, a broken political system, a twisting economic pattern that requires more and more and more, a changing climate. What do I have to bring? It seems so overwhelming. We got a note at church this week scribbled on a piece of paper saying, I will not be joining Gloria Day worship again. I listen to the news all day. I don't want to tune in and hear more of it at church. And I have to tell you, I totally 100% understand that sentiment. There are moments when we just want to be free of it all. We want to stop thinking about it. And can't church be the place where we set the world aside? Which it may be a comfort to know 
has been the struggle for the followers of Jesus ever since that day he walked by the Sea of Galilee and said, hey, you, follow me. The same struggle that inevitably gets asked by everyone who has passed through the baptismal waters or affirms the baptismal promise to proclaim the good news of Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. It's probably not long after the I do and I ask God to help and guide me that we begin to wonder how or even do I really want to do this? The first inclination of the disciples on the hillside that morning was to send the people away, send them into the town, send them to people who have more resources, more ability, more willingness to solve this hunger problem. We're tired. To which Jesus simply says, bring what you have. Could there be more gospel in that command? Bring what you have. Bring who you are today, not who you think you'll be tomorrow or who you will grow into in the future. Bring now. Bring what's in your pockets. Bring what's in your pack or what's in your heart or your brain or your bank account. Just bring it. And it's true that the bread we bring is likely to be half-baked. And the fish that we offer should have been refrigerated days ago. Bring it, Jesus says, and place it in my hands. And then he gives thanks. He gives thanks to God for what is offered and then gives it back to them to share. This is the mystery, the miracle of it all, that when it comes back to us, it actually looks just like it did before, but it turns out that it's enough to feed the people set before us. It's enough for everyone to be able to share this meal. It's enough to give away. In fact, the real miracle is that in the giving away, we discover that there is even more. The fear of letting go, of giving away something that we're not sure we're able to, or letting go of the belief that, I can't make a difference. Sets free something inside of us that makes us keep going. Suddenly you're scrounging around in your cupboards. You're digging deeper in your pack. You're plumbing the depths of your internal resources. You're rethinking your investments because there is joy and peace and grace in this mysterious, priceless, costly, holy exchange. Maybe the part of the miracle of this story is that the you in the Bible is always plural. Bring what you have isn't meant for an individual, but for a community. In fact, Jesus is simply calling those disciples to be church. 
to be together. It's probably easy for us right now to forget this communal dimension of the faith while we are separated and apart and can't gather on Sunday morning. We can't get together and look across the aisle and see those one or two faces that give us hope and tell us that, you know, we can do this. Everything's going to be okay. Right now, it's so easy for us to turn inward and to become insular and then isolated. But the truth we can't forget, church, is that we are all sitting on this grass together on the mountainside. Every single one of us is hungry in some way, and every single one of us has something to share that can meet the hunger of the other. Together, it is a miraculous feast. In the hands of Jesus, what we bring becomes enough for all. In the prayer tent, it dawned on me at the end that my quiet breath, my breathing for eight minutes and 46 seconds that I thought was nothing was precisely the thing that was taken away from George Floyd. So as I drove home, it occurred to me, I had been given life. We have been given life and breath and spirit and bread and wine. One another, this day, this family, this job, this world, even this pain that can grow into compassion, or this grief, this separation that leans into community, this life that we have been given today, right now, is the priceless gift. Bring it. Place it in the hands of Jesus and give thanks just as he does, and then receive it back, take it back, and share it. Because there is enough. In fact, there is more than enough, an abundance that we can hardly fathom. And with Jesus, we hold it. Amen.
joining together in different places, yet one in the Spirit. Let us pray for all who are in need. O God, our Savior, bless your church around the world. Where believers must be isolated from one another, be present through your gracious word and sacrament. Give to our bishops, pastors, deacons, and congregational leaders wisdom for their tasks in this challenging time. God, in your mercy. O oh God, Redeemer of all, bless the Jewish people with your covenant promises. Bring an end to global anti-Semitism and strengthen ties of cooperation and friendship between Christians and Jews. God, in your mercy. O oh God, creator of a wondrous earth, protect the glories of your seas and lands, replenish groundwater supplies, refresh lakes and ponds, send rains where there is drought, and shelter forests from wildfires. God, in your mercy. O oh God, sovereign of the world, from the leaders of nations to strive for justice for all, guide our government in dealing with China, strengthen the world's democracies, bring an end to racism in our society, show our elected officials in how to govern with integrity. God, in your mercy. O oh God, storehouse of goodness, visit all who face the coronavirus, especially those who are incarcerated. Give us, O Lord of life, a vaccine. Assist all who face eviction from their residence. Bring wholeness and healing to those who suffer in body or spirit, especially those whom we name here, silently, aloud in our homes, or in the chat window. God, in your mercy. O oh God, giver of bread, teach us how to feed the hungry, the children starving in war zones, the families who cannot afford groceries, the homeless on our streets, the farmers devastated by pestilence. Give to all creatures their food in due season. God, in your mercy. O oh God, everlasting mercy, we praise you for the lives of all who have died in the faith especially Kevin Stendhal. Comfort those who grieve with your ever-present support. At the end, bring us all with your saints to your heavenly banquet, God in your mercy. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. At this time, we collect an offering. As always, you can give electronically online using the link on your screen, or you can simply mail a check to the church office. We thank you again and again for your generosity during these times.
Let us pray. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Just a few announcements as we conclude our service today. First, we hope you will join us after worship today for our virtual coffee hour on Zoom. You can go to the link you see on your screen and then that will take you to a Zoom meeting where we'll be able to see one another. If you haven't been to one of our coffee hours, come today. It'll be fun. It's only about a half hour long, and it's a chance for us to be in small groups together, catching up with old friends, making some new friends, and just staying connected to one another in this time of pandemic. In August, as Gloria Day staff prepares for the fall programming, which will all be online this year, we will hold only one Rooted in Love Gathered on Wednesdays program. So mark your calendars now and plan to join us at the end of the month on August 29th at 7 p.m. for the final large group discussion of our All Congregation Summer Read Dialogues on Race. We'll be discussing chapters 7 through 9. And stay tuned for more information coming soon about our fall programming. Here on earth we have no abiding city, but we seek one that is to come. Our brother in Christ, Kevin Stendahl, died this past weekend on June 25th. Our hearts are breaking for everyone who knew and loved Kevin and especially for his parents, John and Jane Stendahl. Funeral plans will be announced at a later date, but until then, we invite your prayers for the Stendahls, asking that God surround them with comfort and hope and give them strength for the days ahead. God bless you and keep you. God's face shine on you with grace and mercy. God look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.